Today on Not Sam Wrestling Live, Morgan will not be stopped. Huge potential news on the future of Ricochet. The Bloodline members are renamed, and we go down the full card for Clash of the Castle, including an I Quit match and one of Raw's best storylines. This is Not Sam Wrestling. Welcome to Not Sam Wrestling Coming at you at a time when the, the news is all over the place. I do not recall, maybe since the original Monday Night War, right? During the original Monday Night War, WWE versus WCW, Raw versus Nitro, you'd be hearing about contracts all the time because we were living in this era. I mean, starting from the first episode of Monday Nitro when Lex Luger shows up out of nowhere. That may have been it, really. You know, because, of course, there were huge signings in the past. There was uh, 1991 when Ric Flair, I guess Sid Justice showing up in WWE was one of the early kind of big ones. You know, you could go all the way back to when the WWE first formed and you'd see, you know, Hulk Hogan and 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 Sergeant Slaughter and, and all these kind of AWA stars showing up. In the WWE, and of course, stars from other territories showing up. But but from for my generation, I think Sid Justice showing up uh, in 1991. What was that? Probably mid, probably the summer, July. They started running teasers for him for him to debut in August of 1991. When you started to see these these teasers for Sid Justice coming. And you go, oh, that's Sid Vicious. You know, he had just been a monster villain in WCW. That, but, but, you know, if you had the print newsletters being sent to your house, that was something. A year later, or less than a year later, really, a few months later, when Ric Flair showed up in WWE, that was a big coup for the WWE. And then he ends up going back in 93 to WCW. So that was big, but it wasn't really the, with the rate of everything going on. I mean, you could say Lex Luger showing up at, at, at in 93. That was Royal Rumble 93, right? Where the narcissist first showed up. You, Although he did the WBF thing in 92, you could say Lex showing up to WWE was on that same line. It was at least on the Sid Justice level of thinking. But it was when Lex Luger showed up back to WCW on Nitro. When now you've got two shows running head to head. At the same time, you also had the internet just starting to pick up where you could theoretically in 1996 be on different message boards talking about what was going on. There was a ton of email newsletters. I subscribed to a ton of these wrestling newsletters that you just get in your email. And it was like the websites of today. You would just be, you know, there'd be a couple of good ones, but mainly they'd be copy and pasting what all the other newsletters were saying and just sending them out. And some of them were completely made up and some of them were pretty reliable. But while speculation reached a peak that it had not reached yet because you had these two shows running head to head and you had the internet. But it led to part of being a wrestling fan was to kind of be aware of when contracts were up and who could appear where. Because after Luger... You know, it went into the news that Razor Ramon and Diesel were leaving. And then Razor Ramon and Diesel show up in WCW as Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. And then contract discussions amongst fans becomes an even bigger deal because you want to know who's going to join the NWO. I mean, I guess before that, Hogan and Savage going over to WCW, but both Hogan was off. Hogan and Savage were both known to be gone from WWE when they went to WCW. Hogan had been away from WWE for months and Savage, it had been announced on TV that he wasn't in the WWE anymore before he showed up on WCW Saturday night. So that wasn't that kind of surprising. There were rumors, rumbling thing, although it could have been, it was just on a, on a lower key level. But when the NWO started running and it got really hot to the point where a WWE guy that didn't have a lot going on would probably want to jump over there and join the NWO. WCW guys that didn't have a lot going on wanted to become members of the NWO because you instantly were several levels hotter 
than you were before you got there. You're, the temperature went up degrees, degrees hotter. Then Chris Jericho comes over to WWE and Chris Jericho coming over to WWE, it was one thing, WCW, what they really did to me, and I'm just, I haven't done the research into this really. I could be proven wrong, I suppose, but I think WCW, when you look at the contract stuff that they were doing, they would sign big stars from WWE and put them on this platform as you could argue even bigger stars, meaning you would get to WCW and the world would revolve around you. Hogan would get to WCW and as much as he was the centerpiece of WWE and WCW, he literally ran the show. Razor and Diesel, as much as they were centerpieces of WWE, they would get to WCW and the whole show revolved around what they were doing. So the difference in what WWE did, which is arguably what they still do, is they tapped into potential that wasn't fully being tapped into in WCW. And that's a, a, a longer play game. But to me, that's the more winning strategy of any organization, right? So Chris Jericho coming over to WWE and timing, of course, is everything. Because this is when WWE is really taking the lead. This is post-WrestleMania 14. This is post-Mike Tyson on Raw. And Chris Jericho shows up and he goes from somebody who was in the cruiserweight division who couldn't get the program that he should have gotten with Goldberg on WCW television to go over to WWE and instantly be put on screen with The Rock, instantly be put into pay-per-view matches, instantly be given time with a microphone on Monday Night Raw, which was some of the most valuable real estate in the television landscape. So then it started to go the other way where you started to pay attention to when the WCW guys' contracts would be up. And, and you'd hear like rumors that, you know, they released the Radicals and Perry Saturn and Eddie Guerrero that they had been released and they were going right over to WWE. But kind of since the end of WCW and since the end of that highly competitive space, I don't feel like contracts have been nearly as big of a discussion as they are today, I mean, even recently. Like the, the talk about wrestlers' contracts right now is so much more than even a, a year ago. We were just talking about Becky Lynch's deal and the fact that, that, that she may be without a professional wrestling contract right now. And, and that leaves the world to be her oyster. You know, you hear all these rumors over here about Chad Gable. You hear all these rumors over here about this person. But the the big rumor mill news that broke uh, within the last couple of days is that according to PW Insider, which is a fairly reputable wrestling site, uh, they say Ricochet has given notice that he's leaving the WWE when his deal is up this summer. That's all it says is this summer. There's no known date on when this contract ends. We don't know if this summer means, you know, end of this month. We don't know if it means through SummerSlam. Don't know. It just says, not that I've read anyway, um, which is really, really interesting. Big if true. I'll say that. Big if true. Uh, Ricochet has had a very interesting run in the WWE, but I would say thus far a fairly successful run. In WWE, you'd be hard pressed to say that Ricochet has not found a lot of success in the WWE. He had his run. He had his run as the Intercontinental Champion before Gunther took it away from him. And even after that, it's not like he wasn't used in a real way. Even right now, you know, being a part of the uh, uh, of the whole thing with with uh, 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 what's it, Braun Breaker coming in and Ilya Dragunov and being there as part of that that sort of three-person rivalry thing happening. But it was less than a year ago that he had a massive match at SummerSlam with Logan Paul. And they're not just handing out Logan Paul matches to whoever. That's a lot of faith to have in somebody, not just in the fact that the match is going to be good. Because the whole appeal of Logan Paul is that not only is he this massive celebrity, but that he's actually very good. So the last thing that you want to do is put him in there with anybody. 
that will make him look less than very good. And Ricochet will kind of make everybody he's with look great. Ricochet is an incredible talent. But also, Logan Paul's a heel. He can't be put in there with people who the crowd can't get behind. He can't be put in there with people who don't have the ability to get that good guy reaction. And Ricochet giving being given that opportunity and meeting that opportunity successfully kind of shows you that he's he's an upper tier good guy, uh, as it were, both, I would think, in the eyes of the WWE, but certainly, I would imagine, in the eyes of WWE fans. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because if he is gone over the summer, as now we're all contract uh, experts, that I would imagine means there's no, uh, uh, you know, 30-day, 90-day non-compete. It's, well, contract's over, so go do whatever it is that you're going to do. And it's not so cut and dry with Ricochet. First of all, you know, beyond when is his contract actually up, you got a ton of questions. Presumably, can he keep his name? He was Ricochet before he got to WWE. Will he be able to be Ricochet if he's leaving WWE? Where will he go? Of course, AEW is the first name that pops up. But the idea that, that you know, TNA is becoming viable as one of the places that you go. You know, that is a path that people go. That you do TNA as well as multiple other spots. It's kind of like WWE, AEW, or everything else, which includes TNA. And it also includes New Japan Pro Wrestling. Ricochet could have a, a tremendous run in New Japan Pro Wrestling. But if you look at AEW, that's where people that he's got history with are right now. From his days in Lucha Underground, he's got a tremendous background with Swerve. That's one of those matches that people talk about. He's got a tremendous history with Will Ospreay. That's one of those matches that people talk about. Not just the potential of it happening now, but remember when it did. Those are those matches that... You know, when you see Ricochet do an interview, those are the matches that people bring up, aside from what he's done in WWE. So the fact that they're both in AEW, they you've already got multiple doors there. The question is, is there a, a, a reasonable amount of faith that he goes to AEW and he's put in a more positive, he's put in a bigger spotlight, which maybe doesn't matter. I'm not in the guy's head. Maybe he just wants to go make some money and wrestle different people. That's possible, you know? Um, I do think that, you know, when we talk about history and people being signed over successfully, that Chris Jericho signing was a big one for WWE. The same way the Cody signing was a big one for WWE. The same way the Jade Cargill signing was a big one for WWE because all three of those examples, and there's many more. Ethan Page <laughs> is a good example for WWE because what it does is anybody that is not happy with where they're at right now, they might look at somebody who's gone over there and gone, man, look at the way they're showcased. I'd like to be showcased like that. Ricochet is an opportunity to do just that in the opposite direction. If you can do it successfully, if you can go make Ricochet, you know, be the type of person that can headline Wembley Stadium, doesn't even have to be Wembley, headline multiple pay-per-views, then maybe there are people who feel like they have the potential to headline that they're not getting the opportunity for. I mean, it's just, it's, if you can do that, I think it would be good. Um, I think a lot of questions, of course, come up because we all love Samantha Irvin. And will this impact her? I can't imagine. I can't imagine that this will impact Samantha Irvin. Of course, everybody wants to be around the person that they're in a relationship with. Everybody wants to be around their partner. But ultimately, people got to go to work too. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't imagine that, but who knows? I have no idea. I would hope it doesn't. Or wouldn't it be fun if this is new kayfabe, not to say that it, I honestly don't think it is. I haven't spoken to anybody. I don't think that it is. But I think that when we're sitting here and we're following the rules of not saying wrestling and we're watching the product and everything counts, but then right there in the middle, 
is the road to wild speculation. We're living in an era of new kayfabe where we do have to be aware of how stories are told and what resonates with the audience. And we are in an era, in a moment, where contract news is resonating with hardcore wrestling fans. Wrestling fans that consume wrestling content regularly on the internet, that are watching the shows, but that's not enough. That are downloading podcasts, that are watching YouTube videos. They love contract news. You can look at the numbers. Contract news is king. <laughs> that's, it. that's what they say. So if this isn't it, and it could be, but it could not be, will at some point we see this sort of, you know, uh, 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 th uh, thirst for contract news be utilized by a promotion to, to tell a story? I don't know if it's happening now. I don't know if it will happen in the future. But I think it will be, it would be a great idea because the one thing I will say about WWE is they are running on all cylinders as far as storytelling goes right now. You look at Monday Night Raw and you've got multiple stories where you're like, you know what? On paper, who knew? But in execution, I'm locked in. I'm locked in. And one of those stories is of course the story that, that we were speculating wildly about here on Not Sam Wrestling uh, from the time basically that Rhea Ripley went down with injury, which is the story of Liv Morgan and Dominic Mysterio. Liv Morgan will not stop. I was watching her on Monday Night Raw when she cornered Dominic Mysterio, wondering who will get out here and stop this before Liv Morgan's hands go too far for television. This is insane what we're seeing here. And of course, Finn Balor comes and breaks the whole thing up. Um, I was okay when Finn Balor uh, broke up that first interaction because Dom was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What did I get involved with? Now look, I don't think you come out there not knowing what you're getting involved. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did I get involved with? The second one, when we were back uh, uh, towards the end of the night and Liv Morgan and Dominic Mysterio are on the outside of the ring because Dominic was not taking his eyes off of Liv Morgan at that point. Finn Balor getting involved. That one felt to me a little more like you're hating now. That one felt to me like, okay, you know when your boy is like talking to a girl and you know the girl's no good for him. You got to pull him aside and you got to tell him because you're boys. It's what you got to do. But you tell him once, and you let that adult make a decision. Okay, you are not that boy's father. And if you were that boy's father, first of all, I got more questions. And second of all, the more your parents tell you not to do something, the more likely you are to do it. The Judgment Day needs to, at some point, Dominic Mysterio makes good decisions, okay? Sometimes he ends up in jail, but all's well that ends well. At some point, Unless Finn Balor is a confirmed hater, which I don't think he is, but it was coming across that way on Monday Night Raw. Unless he is a confirmed hater, Finn Balor is going to have to allow Dominic Mysterio to travel the road that Dominic Mysterio feels that he needs to travel. This is such, such a, a, a good spot for Liv Morgan. Like every time she comes out, you can hear the audience going like, oh boy, this is going to be trouble. Because she's not allowed. I mean, and, and she, Liv Morgan as the temptress is what I feel like has legs here. I don't think that Liv Morgan and Dominic Mysterio is a long-term thing. I think that once Rhea Ripley comes back, once this story is told, we're not moving the Dominic Mysterio character into this thing where he and Liv Morgan are just now what, mommy and dommy were, okay? I don't think that Liv Morgan is the new mommy. However, I think that there has been this question of how can Liv Morgan possibly be a villain? Everybody loves Liv Morgan. Everybody relates to Liv Morgan. Everybody thinks, you know, she just, people get happy when Liv Morgan comes out. I was at a live event while all this was going on and people still just instinctively cheer Liv Morgan. How do you make her into a villain? If you make her the ultimate temptress, the ultimate seductress, 
where everybody knows this is a woman who is utilizing control over people. She is manipulating. She's being manipulative and feigning attraction to you. And you watch her do it to person after person after person. But there's something about this Liv Morgan where you can't, you can't stop it. I mean, this is, this is the odyssey. Do not go to those singing voices. Those singing voices. Your ship will sink if you go to those singing voices. Oh, yeah, but those, they sing so good. I know, but I'm telling you. I'm telling you it's a trick. I know, but the song is so good. We should check it out. No, we know what it is. We know what it is. They make you go check out the song, and then they sink your boat, and then they eat you or something. I didn't read the whole Odyssey. Yeah, but we should go check out the song. That's Liv Morgan. And and I think that mission number one, again, is not just mission take Dominic away. It's mission take everything away. If you watch how the Judgment Day is being portrayed, and it was portrayed specifically last week on Raw to, to show you that what is the foundation of the Judgment Day, what is keeping the Judgment Day together is Damian Priest. Finn Balor is doing what Finn Balor does. He's obsessed with his abdominals. You know, I, I don't think Finn Balor is, is as focused as he once was. J.D. McDonough is happy to be there. Carlito, nobody even can take ownership of this Carlito. Nobody knows what he's doing there. And of course, Dominic Mysterio, he ain't here for a long time. He's here for a good time. And that's why I respect Dominic Mysterio. But ultimately, why is the Judgment Day even in a conversation? as to who is dominating Monday Night Raw, and the answer is solely Damian Priest. And we saw that on, on Raw when, at the end of the show, Damian Priest was able to immediately take advantage of Drew McIntyre being distracted and choke slam him through that table. And he almost has this look around going like, don't forget, we're all having fun. You're all having fun watching the shenanigans of the Judgment Day. But there's a reason why, even after Rhea Ripley went down with injury, we were able to maintain. There's a reason why, even with all the R-Truth nonsense going on, we were taken seriously. And that's because of El Champeon. That's because of Damian Priest. Which is why I don't think there's a chance that Damian Priest goes with Liv Morgan. However, I don't know. I don't know. There is something... When Finn Balor got in between Liv Morgan and Dominic Mysterio, now all of a sudden Finn Balor and Liv Morgan are face to face. And Finn Balor is going, he doesn't want anything to do with you. And it's almost like, dude, what are you doing here, Finn? What are you doing? What are you trying to do here? Are you protecting your boy or are you getting jealous and trying to see if you can get something going yourself? Either way, I don't think it'll be romantic. But I do think that Liv Morgan will convince J.D. and Finn Balor to turn on Damian Priest and thus Rhea Ripley. And I think the Judgment Day as we know it will be done. It won't be Judgment Day A, Judgment Day B. It'll just, no more Judgment Day. If there is a Judgment Day, it'll be Balor, J.D., and Dominic, which is not the same thing. So I feel like just be done with the Judgment Day and let these characters exist. They could still be homies. They could still be buds. But no more Judgment Day. On one end of things, Damian Priest, J.D. McDonough, and Dominic Mysterio have been torn away by Liv Morgan. And on the other side of things, once Rhea Ripley comes back, her and Damian Priest are once again unified as these terror twins or whatever they call themselves. And by the time we get to SummerSlam, if Rhea Ripley is back, as I've been saying here on the podcast, Damian Priest is a babyface. And so when he faces Gunther... He's got a giant heel, and now he's a babyface who's gone through people. And part of the plan that I'm telling you is for Damian Priest to survive at Clash at the Castle. It's a big moment. We have uh, uh, two massive stories that aren't necessarily intertwined but colliding at Clash at the Castle from Monday Night Raw as the World Heavyweight title match is Damian Priest defending against Drew McIntyre. 
So on one end of things, you have all the drama going on with the Judgment Day. On the other end of things, you've got Drew McIntyre, who's got all his CM Punk stuff going on. But at the same time, his motivation has always been to get that moment back. His moment has now been stolen from him to ice. To ice. All he wants to do is be the guy and receive the adulation from the WWE universe. And they just won't let him have it. So now he's got the opportunity to receive all that adulation at the Clash at the Castle. <sighs> a lot of people think that they, uh, Drew McIntyre is going to win that title. He didn't win it at the last Clash of the Castle that was in Wales. Now he's even closer. They said, oh my God, he's got a hometown advantage in Wales. Now he's actually in Scotland. The Scottish warrior is actually in Scotland, ready to receive his destiny. What he feels is already his, the World Heavyweight Championship. And people are looking at this going, yes, I see Drew McIntyre. A lot of people that I've read anyway think that there's a good chance that Drew McIntyre walks out of Scotland as the World Heavyweight Champion and thus goes on to a match with CM Punk for the championship also would get Drew McIntyre versus Gunther for the World Heavyweight Championship at SummerSlam. Now, I don't know when Punk is back in wrestling, but I truly believe that the fact that we have all of this sort of thought that, okay, Drew's finally going to get his Clash of the Castle moment is only more reason to have CM Punk screw it up for him. I mean, you have to, don't you? You have to have CM Punk screw this up for him. It sucks for Drew. Like, honestly, I think the move might be, because you're going to do more than one match with Drew McIntyre and CM Punk. I've got to believe. This is a story that you've literally been building since December. And then put the pedal to the metal in January. And then really, since WrestleMania, at least, every single week, there have been references to Drew McIntyre and CM Punk. I don't remember the last time a match had this much hype, meaning amount of time, right? I don't remember the last time a match had this much background and was still going. I think... CM Punk costing Drew McIntyre the World Heavyweight Championship in Scotland, in Glasgow, is like the ultimate, now you've crossed the line. You made fun of my, my, my tweets. You made fun of my trolling abilities. My family's name has been coming up. You cost me the world title. You cost me my shot at the world title, my number one contendership, but now... Now we're in Scotland. Now we're getting serious. And for CM Punk to go that far, it's like, well, now it's on like Donkey Kong. I think that that this is the last match that CM Punk costs Drew McIntyre because it doesn't get any bigger than this in terms of costing him matches. And, and then I kind of feel like the first Drew McIntyre-CM Punk match, have Drew McIntyre beat him. Story-wise... You know, of course, everybody wants to see CM Punk win. Of course, this would be his first televised singles match. Hypothetically, if you're going right to, I'm coming back from injury in my first match with Drew McIntyre. He has not had a televised singles match. He's had one televised match. It was the Royal Rumble match. He had two live event matches, I think, with Dominic Mysterio. And that's it. Of course, everybody wants to see CM Punk win. Of course, everybody wants the good guy to beat the bad guy. But ultimately, what furthers the story more? This goes back to my th thing with Cody Rhodes early on. What furthers the story more? What allows for more foundation on this house that we're building? I feel like everybody benefits more. If CM Punk cost Drew McIntyre the title at Clash, and then in response whether we do the match at SummerSlam, whether we do the match later in the year, whenever we can do the match, whenever that tricep is fully healed, 
Drew has been talking his you-know-what for months. If Drew is cost the World Heavyweight Championship after uh, Wrestle- at WrestleMania, then cost the number one contendership, then cost the World Heavyweight title again at Clash at the Castle, and then after all the crap talk, he loses to CM Punk? I don't really know where Drew McIntyre goes after that. If Drew McIntyre beats CM Punk in their first match, you've now got Drew with a solid foundation where everything that I just said has been made up for. CM Punk costing his match, costing him his matches have been made up for, and all of his trolling has proven to be true. So we're good. We've also got a babyface good guy, CM Punk, that's got to climb up and climb up and climb up to get back. Okay, you beat me, Drew. Now I got to figure out how to beat you. And then if he beats Drew in the rematch, and then again in the rubber match, Drew still has that foundation of beating CM Punk in his first match back. That doesn't go away. CM Punk can beat Drew multiple times after that. That first win doesn't go away. And after that CM Punk rivalry, because I feel like you do, I would love to see SummerSlam, if CM Punk can get back for it, I would love to see Drew beat Punk. I would love to see Gunther beat Damian Priest. We could then do Drew versus Gunther unless we go right to another Punk versus Drew match. Because what we're eventually getting to is maybe at Survivor Series or Royal Rumble, CM Punk versus Gunther for the World Heavyweight title. And I'm like trying to figure out, okay, we got CM Punk versus Drew, CM Punk versus Gunther, and by then... Maybe we're ready for CM Punk versus Seth Rollins. Eventually, we're going to get to CM Punk versus Cody Rhodes. You know, we, like like we've we've now got this mapped out to where you can have you can fully utilize the potential of CM Punk, which is to have these mega mega matches, which is what I always said he always should have been doing, even in AEW. Like, don't worry about the week to week stuff. Don't worry about wrestling everybody. Mega matches with stories. Also at Clash at the Castle. So that's why I've got uh, McIntyre losing to Damian Priest uh, because of CM Punk. The other best story on Monday Night Raw right now is the Alpha Academy thing. You talk about somebody who has been given an opportunity and showcased what his potential truly is, Chad Gable. What Chad Gable has done is he's proven that he can be fun. He's proven that he can be entertaining. He's proven that he can do the ha-ha and, and, and have people go, oh, it's so fun. Here comes the Alpha Academy. What he's also proven is he can be a serious villain. He can be a total a-hole, this Chad Gable. And in doing that, he can help get Otis back to this place. You talk about a moment being stolen. People forget WrestleMania 36 which was Drew McIntyre's big moment, which he had with a ceiling fan going and no fans in the building because of the pandemic. You know what else happened at that WrestleMania? The culmination of Otis and Mandy Rose. Otis and Mandy Rose finally embracing, finally kissing in the middle of the ring. If that had happened in a stadium, it would have been a classic WrestleMania moment. But because it happened in a warehouse with nobody there, Nobody remembers it happened. It led to Otis winning the money in the bank. Uh, you know, a month or two later, I think a month later. Nobody remembers that either, really. But Otis had this moment where it was like the whole world was on his side. That stadium would have erupted. We are finally inching back to that moment. When you feel the rumbling of fan support, Beneath the feet of Otis, as they are begging, pleading, Otis, stand up for yourself. Otis, strike down Master Gable once and for all. Every single week, we are waiting for that to happen. The anticipation is wonderful. Interesting, too, that Sami Zayn is the one orchestrating all of it. 
because Sami Zayn is the master of the babyface turn, meaning he turns on somebody, but is still the babyface for turning. Sami Zayn turned on Roman Reigns. Sami Zayn lied to Roman Reigns. Sami Zayn betrayed Roman Reigns. And in doing that, was the biggest good guy that he's ever been. He's gotten to the point now where he's saying, Otis, betray Chad Gable. Otis, turn on Chad Gable. Otis, attack Chad Gable. And in doing that, Otis will be the greatest good guy that he's ever been. I mean, you talk about coaching. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So when does it happen? Is this something we're going to see at Clash at the Castle? Because at Clash at the Castle, we've got Sami Zayn versus Chad Gable for the Intercontinental Championship. And it is so interesting because so many people didn't understand why Sami Zayn would be the one instead of Chad Gable to get to WrestleMania to take out Gunther. People were like to the point where Sami Zayn was actually getting haters and doubters for the first time in a very long time. Going, whoa, 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 why isn't Gable getting this opportunity? It should be Gable. This is why I say let him cook. Give him months if need be. They hopefully won't let you down. They haven't let you down here. Because what we've gotten to is a point where you've got Chad Gable and Sami Zayn in this deep rivalry that is family deep, involving Chad Gable's family, involving Sami Zayn's family, suplexed him out of his wife's arms. I don't know if we've ever seen that before. And then right alongside that is this amazing heroic story of Otis standing up for himself finally against Chad Gable. And the whole world believes in this Sami Zayn, Chad Gable story and believes in the Chad Gable, Otis story. And I do wonder if the turn finally happens at Clash at the Castle, because I feel it's a stadium match, dude. Chad Gable versus Otis is a stadium match. You gotta wait until SummerSlam for Chad Gable versus Otis. I hope they are. I hope that that happens. I would love to see Chad Gable versus Otis at SummerSlam. And if, that, if that's the case, SummerSlam is what? August 3rd. It's June 9th. June 10th. June, what, what, when is Clash at the Castle? You know, what is it? June 15th? <sighs> that's two months. Do we see Otis? But people are ready for the turn to happen at the same time. So... Otis could, the turn could happen on Chad Gable. Now, if the turn happens on Chad Gable at Clash of the Castle, then Chad Gable could say he wants one more opportunity and try to get an Intercontinental Championship match at Money in the Bank, which would then allow us to wait until SummerSlam for the Otis match. Or maybe, maybe Otis, maybe that's the move, right? Maybe Otis turns on Chad Gable. And then Otis says to Sami Zayn, I appreciate everything you've done for me. I'd only like one thing and one more favor. Anything, Otis. I'd like an opportunity at the Intercontinental Championship. And then we go forward with this kind of babyface versus babyface, Sami Zayn versus Otis. At which point you have the Creed brothers who Chad Gable has been seen talking to, interrupting. So the Creed brothers help beat down Otis. They can hold Sami Zayn back. The Creed brothers can. They can take care of Akira Tozawa beforehand in the back. Maxine can come to the ring and scream, no, no. And then Chad Gable can, can put a beating on Otis while the Creed brothers assist him. And then we can head to SummerSlam and Chad Gable has his buddy Akira Tozawa, Maxine, and maybe even Sami Zayn is helping him out. I mean, Otis, I think. I don't know if I said Chad Gable or Otis. Versus Chad Gable, who now has the Creed brothers with him. Now, I'm not saying they come to the ring. I don't necessarily need to see Sami Zayn at ringside with Otis. 
But when Otis does beat Chad Gable, I'd love to see Sami Zayn come out and celebrate with Otis and have that moment all happen together at SummerSlam. Because again, I mean, when you've got all that goodwill being shoved Otis's way, why not throw Sami Zayn in the ring with him? It makes sense. And then all that love that we have that we're sending out to the ring, Sami Zayn gets to catch a little of that. Why not? Many people benefit as possible from it. Aside from those two matches, uh, Clash at the Castle, you got Bailey versus Piper Niven for the Women's World Championship. I thought Piper Niven's promo on SmackDown was terrific. Thought it was really, really good. Uh, and it gave you a reason to believe that she could win. I don't think she will. But it gave you a reason to believe that she could. You've got uh, Jade and Bianca versus Alba Fire and Isla Dawn versus Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark. Um, you know, I think... Alba and Isla are way better not doing the uh, character heavy work, not doing the kind of like still being a little bit mysterious, but more being regular people, especially Isla Dawn. I think Isla Dawn's been really, really good. Just kind of being there backstage. She's just, I, I don't know. There's some, it, it's good. I think both of them being regular people, but still being villainous and still being a little tricky has been good. Uh, you know, Jade and Bianca could lose the tag title here since it's a triple threat and then win it back from whatever team beats it. Like maybe Shayna and Zoe pin Isla and Alba and then Jade and Bianca chase Shayna and Zoe. It's possible, but I think in all likelihood, Jade and Bianca keep it. And then of course, the main event. It's time for the main event. I quit match AJ Styles versus Cody Rhodes. This is a story that has been very well told over the last couple of weeks. Um, AJ Styles came out on SmackDown and just straight up hit Cody Rhodes with that Batista, give me what I want. And he got it. Although Cody Rhodes got to set the stipulation. So I love angry Cody. When Cody gets angry, I love it. Because Cody has got the, Cody needs to have this don't mistake my uh, kindness for weakness vibe and I think that's what happens when he gets angry and we've seen him get angry a couple of times right he got angry uh, really angry during the Roman Reigns uh, uh, run up I guess it happened a little bit during Logan Paul but not too much and then big time right now with AJ Styles and I love that I love it because it's like okay now 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 you've 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 crossed the line right I'm a good guy I'm a professional I'm polite I'm 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 here to compete but don't mess with me. Now you're messing with me. So I thought it was very appropriate that he got upset with AJ Styles. Um, I also love, I love the little things. I love that Cody Rhodes said, I'm going to make you say what you should have said last week, which is I quit. Why are we doing an I quit match? Well, you, well because Cody and AJ are so good because we need a stipulation because we already did it once. Make it simple. Give me a narrative to it. The reason we're doing an I quit match is because AJ Styles pretended he was going to quit WWE. So now he's got to do an I quit match. He didn't say that he was retiring on SmackDown. So now Cody's got to make him say I quit. I love that. It's simple. It's to the point. It, 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 it raises the stakes somewhat. I, I, th I thought it was really, I thought it was really cool. Um, I, in, in, in hindsight, you know, I feel like the nucleus of this story is AJ Styles being in Nick Aldis's office and telling Nick Aldis, well, I don't, I can't go to the back of the line. Time is limited. You know what I mean? I think that when we first saw that, it seemed like the emphasis of that conversation was AJ saying that his career, that his time left in his career is limited. But the truth is that his time in his career being limited is what means that he can't go to the back of the line. And that's what's motivated him to do things like he plans on doing to Cody Rhodes. And I go back to what I said last week. I'm sitting here and I'm going... How does either person say I quit? Now, the thing about an I quit match is it becomes very difficult 
to have a third match unless it's a rubber match or unless there's some kind of chicanery. Cody Rhodes cannot win an I quit match with chicanery. And if AJ Styles says I quit because Cody has him in something that he can't get out of, well, then I don't know what AJ Styles, where he goes going forward. You know, I think that the, the Good Brothers being on the side of AJ Styles again is going to stack the deck against Cody Rhodes. I Look, I don't think Cody's going to lose the championship. I don't think that, I, I, I don't. But it's not the craziest thing. Because I, I like rack my brain. An I quit match is a difficult stipulation in the sense that you really have to be creative in how you get to the ending unless you just want the ending to be a declarative win because there really is no more declarative win. You could get pinned and just say, well, it was an off night. But when it's an I quit match and you say I quit, that's as declarative as a win can possibly be. And if Cody beats AJ Styles twice in a row, the second time being an I quit match, I don't know, maybe AJ blames the Good Brothers. You know, if Finn Balor were on SmackDown, I'd go, you know what you could do? You, I mean, I don't know. It gets real complicated, right? Because you could have AJ blame the Good Brothers. And then somebody like a Tama Tonga defends the Good Brothers. And then you rope AJ into a bloodline story and have him kind of go back to being a babyface by proxy. But combining the Good Brothers and the bloodline through the Bullet Club, there is connective tissue there. But it just feels like it gets so overcomplicated. It's all, you know, maybe what you do is you have AJ lose the I quit match. This is what, probably what you do. Because the bloodline needs, needs something. The bloodline needs some, some, some meat. You know what I mean? And I don't think they're ever going to get clean wins over Kevin Owens or Randy Orton. I don't think that they would do that to Kevin Owens and Randy Orton. I don't think that they should do that to Kevin Owens and Randy Orton. And so, but I also don't know, like the bloodline can't like be put down before Roman Reigns gets back either. So I don't exactly know where this winds up. What you could do is have AJ Styles lose and he says, I quit. And he gets up and shakes Cody's hand. And he gets on SmackDown the following Friday and he says, you know, guys, I did everything that I could to get one more chance before I have to call it quits. I really do. I wasn't lying in anything that I said in the in the blue jacket promo that I gave. Everything that I said was true. And Carl Anderson, I've talked to you about it. And Luke Gallows, I've talked to you about it. Cody gave me the fight of my life twice. And just and 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 I never thought I would have to say those words once but I may be saying them more than once. And everybody goes, no way. Is this a real AJ Styles retirement? And that's when the bloodline swoops in and attacks. That may be, that's a place you could go. The OC versus the bloodline. With AJ kind of becoming a baby face after losing to Cody Rhodes. That is a place uh, where I would go. You know, we saw the bloodline evolve into uh, uh, Solo Sokoa being... Um, recognized as until Roman Reigns gets back sitting at the head of the table. He's the tribal chief until Roman Reigns gets back. Tama Tonga is now the right-hand man, which is really uh, insulting to, to Jey Uso. And uh, Tonga Loa is now the infamous Tonga Loa. I don't mind. I like that word infamous. I don't mind the infamous Tonga Loa, but we do have to see him move forward, I think. I would love to see the, the new bloodline move forward and show what Paul Heyman keeps talking about. Show how like destructive they are. Show how dangerous they are. Show why they're a liability. Because you've told me they're a liability. I'd like to see them be a liability. And I think them going after the OC would do that for me. Um, speaking of Jey Uso, by the way, declaring for money in the bank, I believe he's the only person so far who's declared for money in the bank. 
which uh, I love, could be a favorite. We'll talk about that next week. But I do think it's important to note that one of the benefits of having these premium live events be only five matches that are between like the four big shows, the international ones be only five matches, is that you can have guys like Jey Uso hyping up money in the bank while you have guys like, you know, Drew McIntyre and Damian Priest hyping up Clash at the Castle. Jey Uso doesn't have to look ahead of a match to start hyping up money in the bank because he doesn't, he's not, no, big stars are not going to have matches at every show, which means they can start hyping for the next show. And when you have shows every three weeks, which they do over the summer, I think that's going to be essential. So I think that that's, that's, uh, that's a very good thing. I do want to address, before we get to e emails, um, a real freaky thing happened on Friday. Uh, you know by now, I hope if you're subscribed to the podcast feed or the YouTube channel or however you consume this every single week, which you should, I put out an emergency podcast because I'm watching Monday Night Raw with Megan Morant. And this Uncle Howdy clue shows up and we scan the QR code and it takes us to a directory. And one of the directories is a JPEG. One of the links is a JPEG. And it's myself and Megan in our Raw Talk kind of uh, promo picture. And it says, see you soon over my face. And it's all glitched out. It really creeped me out. And I start getting all these tweets. And then the opening of Raw Talk is 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 an Uncle Howdy video, but it's so scary. It's way more demonic almost than any of these ha have been. And it, they are really driving home that a massacre is coming. We got an, so I was already freaked out. We get another QR code on SmackDown, which again is a series of links. And if you look at these QR codes, they are there's so much more than they were during the White Rabbit. The White Rabbit would be one image, one video, one GIF, one puzzle. This is like so complex. There's so much writing. There's there's so much gamifying. There's so many videos. There's so much audio. There's 55 minute therapy session. I mean, there's an entire production house that Uncle Howdy has somehow taken over to just feed us all of this content. There is a, 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 a tremendous amount of lore that's being piped in to whatever this reported massacre is going to be. But the reason that I got creeped out was because somebody pointed this out to me, one of the great uh, uh, Nightbird channels uh, on YouTube, which there are a couple that I really like, pointed out that if you look, one of the links that was sent out with the Friday night QR code was a link to the video that was played on Raw Talk. And if you look at the file name, if you go to the URL, which you always have to go to the URL because it's full of clues. If you go to the URL, the file name of that video is emergency pod. It's like emergency pod underscore like 1920 by 1080 or whatever the resolution is, dot MOV or whatever. But the title of the video is emergency pod. Uncle Howdy is, I mean, did I ever, th I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Did I ever think, there they are, there they are. Did I ever think, I mean, cause we cover the whole white rabbit thing. We did so much on Bray Wyatt and everything. Did I ever think that not only would Uncle Howdy potentially be back, that we'd be doing another uh, QR code hunt and that he'd be talking to me during these QR codes. I don't like it. It's very scary and it's easy to separate yourself from it, right? When you're just like watching it, you could be like, well, just as a, it's like a horror, I love horror movies. Why? Because they're not real. I could just go on this ride with them. Oh, that was so cool. That was so fun. You know, it's like you get to like uh, be a fly on the wall and watch all this macabre happen in front of your face. Now, I don't have that luxury anymore because Uncle Howdy has sucked me in to whatever this horror movie he's creating is. And I don't like it and I'm frightened by it. But I repent, whatever you need, Uncle Howdy, whatever you need from me, you've got. I'm on your side, simpatico, whatever you need, you got it. Just please don't massacre me. You do have to wonder, he's talking about uh, uh, a massacre, right? And it seems like this massacre is at least gonna begin, if not full-fledged, go forward on June 17th, which is next Monday. It's the Monday after Clash at the Castle 
We started the show talking about Ricochet. If Ricochet is really, you know, headed out of WWE, maybe the massacre comes down on Ricochet. Possible? I think so. Just where my mind's going. But, you know, I can't otherwise think of like, because you, like based on everything that's been going on in these QR code videos, this massacre is going to have to destroy somebody. Somebody's going to have to get destroyed. And who are we trying to destroy? There's such an investment made in everybody. Who are we destroying? Maybe. I don't know. It's very scary right now. Very scary. Hopefully you can calm me down with some of these emails. Email in notsamwrestling at gmail.com is our email address. We read emails every week. Notsamwrestling at gmail.com. By the way, speaking of people reaching out, uh, super excited to hear uh, how many of you have already gotten tickets to our live podcast in Cleveland. It's going to sneak up on you. It's the Thursday before SummerSlam. That's August 1st. If you're going to be in town for SummerSlam, make it a point to be there on Thursday night at Hilarities in Cleveland. Get your tickets now. There's a ticket link at notsam.com. Uh, and we go uh, to the first email who writes, now we almost know that we're going to have priest turning face. I hope so. We don't, I don't think we know that. I don't think that's a guarantee at all, but I hope so. Um, but I can't stop thinking how great it would be if they had used this chance to turn Balor baby face and finally allow him to finish the story by winning the world title. Judgment Day turning against him, Finn battling the Judgment Day alone. I mean, I got finally taking the world title from Priest at SummerSlam would have been one of the most beautiful moments with all of us knowing how much world uh, title uh, ties up his entire WWE career. Sure, but you have to lay the car. You have to play the cards as they lay. Rhea Ripley is the biggest star in the Judgment Day, and I think you've always got the potential with Finn Balor. Finn Balor is one of those talents where it's not. There's never a. It's not a now or never scenario with Finn Balor. Finn Balor is capable at any moment of reminding you that he's a main event player. I think you've got the opportunity here to build Damian Priest into a serious contender. And I think that that is the action that's being taken. You're not wrong. The Finn Balor moment would be great, but also, you know, the idea that we, in this one fell swoop, we keep Rhea Ripley up here. We build Damian Priest as a, as a future massive baby face, keep going forward. You build up Gunther. Like, I, I feel like there is more... If the way the cards are laid out right here, more people benefit than just one. Which you, I'm sure you could do with Finn Balor, but that scenario that you just laid out, one person benefits. This other scenario, if done correctly, multiple people can benefit. And you can still get back to Finn Balor. In fact, with Gunther as champion, it might be even easier. Because you can build Finn Balor as a babyface to take on Gunther. Whether he beats him or not, who knows? But the idea of headlining Finn Balor versus Gunther with a with a babyface Finn Balor, I feel like is even stronger. Because you're not going to do Finn Balor versus the entire Judgment Day with Rhea Ripley. Because people aren't going to boo Rhea Ripley. That's not going to happen, I don't think. So if you take Rhea Ripley out of the Judgment Day... Now you're doing Finn Balor versus the Judgment Day without Rhea Ripley, and it's almost like, does that have the same impact? And what does Damian Priest do after that? You know? How much are you sacrificing here? Uh, let's see. Jack from Michigan writes in, Sam, I'll be at Raw in Toledo on Monday. It's my first ever, which is today, uh, first ever raw, second ever show. So excited. Any tips for attending the show? Love the podcast and love my podcast, Tribal Chief. Just enjoy it, dude. Just get there on time, you know, because raw always starts big. Understand that you'll have moments where you're not watching things happen in the ring. Live events, they keep things in the ring the entire time. On raw, there are commercial breaks, there are backstage promos, you know, but there are also, you know, there are always fun things that happen during commercial breaks. Sometimes they do crotch chops. Sometimes they have McAfee do a promo or something. So there are real fun things to see. Um, but just understand that you won't have as many matches as you do for a live event, but you'll get to see all these stories play out right in front of your face. And I think you'll have a really good time. Uh, Shane writes in, Sam, hope you and the family are doing amazing. I mean, unbelievable. I appreciate that. 
How would you rank these debut vignettes uh, that took place on a beach? Okay, that's a really good question. Crush, Carlito, Kofi Kingston. And when you think of vignettes, is there one that comes to mind first? For me, I always remember Duke the Dumpster Drossy doing trick shots with a garbage can lid. Uh, I know you love that era as well. Thank you. Yes, I love the Duke the Dumpster Drossy vignettes. Um, T.L. Hopper, I believe, had some great vignettes. I think the king of vignettes, you always go back to Mr. Perfect. You know, Ted DiBiase vignettes were great. Dusty Rhodes vignettes were great. But Mr. Perfect's vignettes are, I feel like, top of the heap, untouchable. Ranking the beach vignettes, uh, I would rank Kofi's last only because Kofi didn't excel as a character until after he dropped that accent and got away from the beach. So he wasn't a beach guy. Uh, and then I'm probably, I'm, I'm going to go crush Carlito Kofi, just how you have it. Um, Carlito, it was good, but I don't know. I mean, there were, maybe it's because I was a little kid. But Crush sitting there, walking around on a beach, wearing a purple tank top, crushing coconuts with his bare hands. It's 1992, and I'm all on board the Crush train. We're all pretending he wasn't just wearing face paint and leather and studs with demolition. Just, no, that never existed. But he had the same name. Didn't happen. What do you want me to tell you? And he's just hanging out in Kona, Hawaii. Shut up, bro. What a vibe. What a vibe. Just a giant guy with a mullet vibing out in Hawaii. And he's like, yo, dude, I'm going to come and crush some people's skulls. You want to see? And it's like, yeah, I do, dude. What a vibe. Crush is number one for sure. The Kona Crush from Kona, Hawaii. Joseph, uh, Joey writes in, uh, first time emailer, listening for almost a year now. Well, welcome. Congratulations. It's probably been quite a thrill for you. Uh, following up on WrestleMania 40 and fans being upset about Stone Cold's absence. I was watching some classic King of the Ring and rabbit holed my, myself into SummerSlam 96 Stone Cold. Unknown to me, Stone Cold beat Yokozuna in the SummerSlam 96 pre-show. That's right. Everybody thinks that Austin 316 was like the beginning of this era, was the, was the rise of Stone Cold. It was not. I mean, it took time after that, you know, because SummerSlam 96, he's on the pre-show with Yoko. Uh, Survivor Series 96, really, it's like Stone Cold started taking leaps forward by Royal Rumble 97 because he was in that final four and then WrestleMania 13, but he still didn't win the world title until a year later. Broke his neck in the meantime. Uh, after seeing this, his absence at WrestleMania 40 made sense. Okay, Joey. He's already beaten The Rock many times, including WrestleMania and to add insult to the bloodline, Yokozuna too. I know it's way before and probably a coincidence, but everything counts. What say you? Okay, I mean, everything counts. That is rule number three. But I would argue that SummerSlam 96, Yokozuna, pre-show, summer, free for all. It wasn't even the pre-show. Free for all, SummerSlam 96, Yokozuna was not even 95, Yokozuna. Certainly not 92, 93, Yokozuna. When we talk about Yokozuna, we are really talking about 93, 94. That's the Yokozuna that we're all talking about. Survivor Series 92 to Survivor... Survivor Series 92 to Survivor Series 94. Yes. Because Survivor Series 94 is that casket match rematch with The Undertaker, with Chuck Norris involved. So when you're really looking at Yokozuna's career, why I'm obsessed with Yokozuna and think he's one of the greatest to ever do it, I'm looking at Survivor Series 92, where he debuted against Virgil, a pay-per-view debut, to Survivor Series 94. That's the era that I'm looking at. So Stone Cold beating Yokozuna after a turnbuckle broke at SummerSlam 96 free-for-all is not, oh, yeah, I beat Yokozuna too. Okay, sure you did. But no, no. Who was the last person to beat Stone Cold Steve Austin? It's, it's not... He who laughs loudest gets credit. It's he who laughs last laughs loudest. Okay? The Rock, John Cena beat The Rock. Solo Sokoa beat John Cena. So John Cena came out and took out Solo Sokoa. When we last saw John and Solo. The Rock lost to John Cena. So now there's vengeance there. The Rock comes out and gets vengeance against John Cena. 
Rock beat Stone Cold in Stone Cold's last match. It's not Stone Cold, you know, beat him a bunch of times. At WrestleMania 19, Stone Cold Steve Austin lost his last match to The Rock. It would have made sense for Stone Cold to be there. Now, I was fine with The Undertaker being there. I was fine with Stone Cold not being there. But the idea that he wasn't there because, you know, no, it doesn't. It wouldn't have made sense if he was there. That's really stretching the rules of everything counts. If I'm being fair, I got to be fair, dude. But I appreciate you executing these everything counts rules and thinking outside the box and, and using history. I like that. Uh, Andres, uh, first time emailer, big fan of the podcast. Hope you're doing well. I am doing well. I'll make this as short as possible. I'm doing even better. When Roman Reigns does come back to WWE, what storyline will he be inserted to inserted into possibly? I've thought of three potential storylines. Okay. Number one, Bloodline Civil War against Solo and the Tongans. Number two, Revenge against Seth Rollins for costing him the title against Wrestle, at WrestleMania 40. Number three, Cody Rhodes for the rubber match uh, and a chance to regain his title. Roman Reigns is probably going to be a babyface when he comes back. I don't see him being the same Roman Reigns. I think he's uh, people are going to be so happy to see him. I think the, the bloodline story is the only story to do. Even if at first he seems like he's on their side, the, the, they're naming Tama Tonga the right-hand man. The bloodline civil war is the is is the story for Roman Reigns to come back to. By WrestleMania, we're either looking at bloodline civil war or we've already passed that, and now we're going to Roman versus Seth. I don't feel like we're going to get Roman versus Cody again until after we get Rock versus Cody. And then we're going to get Roman versus Rock too. We still need, we need Bloodline Civil War. We need Roman versus Seth. We need Roman versus Cody. We need Roman versus Rock. All of that is on the horizon, which allows us to speculate wildly. Brian writes in, yo, ask to the AM. That's what they call me. I recently started watching AEW in the last couple months due to needing TBS and TNT for NHL playoff games. It's a lot of information you need to give me. One observation I'd like your perspective on. Dynamite has a three-man commentary team. I think three-man commentary team is hot garbage. <laughs> okay. Two-man teams seems to work a lot better. What does the last professional broadcaster say about it? I mean, it depends on who the people are. You know, I think WWE has zeroed in on some of the best commentary duos they've had in a really long time. I think that each show has a unique voice, and I think each show has an incredible play-by-play -play man and an incredible color commentator. I think Vic and Booker T doing NXT are perfect together. I think Corey and Wade doing SmackDown are perfect together. I think Pat and Cole doing Raw together are perfect together. I think that, that you know, there have been two-man commentary teams in WWE that are not as good as three-man commentary teams have been. You know, I think... Uh, I mean, between Taz, Tony Schiavone, and Excalibur, if that's the three-man team that you're talking about, I don't know who I'd take out, you know? I I, I think, yeah, I, I I think they all have a place, you know? I think that, that Tony is the sort of uh, legendary voice. I think Excalibur is really leading the ship. And I think that, that, that Taz... Uh, is a little off the beaten path, but adds expert analysis from his unique experience in the ring. So, you know, I, I can't make a declarative statement as to three-man commentary teams are hot garbage. I can't say that, but I appreciate the question. Uh, Sunil uh, writes in, uh, one thing that WWE has been doing well is not being as predictable when it comes to their long-term storytelling. I think that that's true. You know, sometimes they are, which throws it off even more when they aren't. So I think that that's true. Um, one thing that I'd like to, where was I? Run by you as a potential swerve. I find it interesting how overly scared Paul Heyman has been with the current version of the bloodline. A person who was in the know with Roman Reigns uh, now knows nothing about what's going on with him. Doesn't make sense. Well, he said Roman hasn't called him. Uh, a couple weeks ago, when Paul asked Solo about Cody, Solo said, we have him where we want him. Paul didn't even know who is we. I think most people assume The Rock is somehow involved with this current version of the bloodline, but I think that's too obvious. I think ultimately Roman comes back as a baby face. However, we've seen the new storytelling requires uh, to the comeback. I think Roman has to lose everything 
Bro, don't. You sent this on Saturday, okay? So this is... I think whenever Roman comes back, he's going to try to potentially save Paul Heyman from the bloodline, but end up realizing that Heyman has been in charge the whole time in the ultimate swerve. This will leave Roman with no bloodline, no wise man, no family. This can lead him to apologizing to Jay and Jimmy. Trust that. Would love to hear your thoughts. Sunil, watch the product. You're pitching me the storyline that I pitched last week. I literally just posted a clip about this. Where... Are you nuts? You're writing in to my podcast, pitching me a storyline that I pitched last week. I'm not saying you have to listen every single week, but at least if you're going to email in, you could figure out if I've talked about it before. Going to be key is the idea that this new bloodline is a threat to Roman Reigns. There's a clip. I want to see Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns as baby faces. I want to see what a Paul Heyman baby face looks like. But... Would it make more sense? I mean, for the we talking to actually be Paul. We get a promo on SmackDown with Paul Heyman and Kevin Owens. Paul Heyman. Would it make more sense for the we to actually be Paul? You are mirroring my own theory back to me and asking me to expand upon it. Of course, I think that's a good idea. It's literally my idea. This doesn't differ at all from what I set up last week. I'm only doing one show. It wasn't even an emergency pod. All you have to do is listen to the weekly show. This is my idea, Sunil. What are you doing? What are you doing? Two rules with these emails. Number one, reread your email back to yourself to see if it makes sense. See if you can even sell yourself on it because some of it, come on. And number two, watch the product. It's rule number two of the whole podcast. Don't write in. If you're going to write in emails, at least listen to the last couple weeks of shows. Oh, you're too hard on the emailers. This is insulting. This is like when my kids are like, you know, oh, I didn't know the oven was hot. It's because you don't listen to me. Sunil, I'm not going to apologize to you either. Caden writes in, hey, Sam, I hope you're doing great. I'm not. You should have heard the last email I got. I just wanted to ask you about this fantasy book I I thought of having Ethan Page eventually get the NXT championship. Okay, look, because this is coming out, I mean, I'm not going to come. I'm going to let this one fly because by the time this show comes out, we've already seen the Ethan Page match on Battleground. But I do uh, appreciate the email and we could talk more next week about that. Um, Let's go to Christopher. What's the hap, Sammy Bram Muffins? Well, the haps are that I am starting to calm down a little bit. I'm starting to chill out a little bit. With the WWE PLE cards carrying less matches in this new era, have you heard? <laughs> yeah, I heard about the new era. <laughs> then previously, what would you think about the return of brand-specific PLEs? It makes sense to me from a creative perspective as a way to feature all important feuds and performers on a specific brand. I loved it the last time the brand split uh, mattered in 2016 to 2017. There was one PLE where half of the matches on the card were women's matches, even with fleshed out storylines and reasons for being on that card. That being said, I understand that they are not financially viable since I'm pretty sure attendance was down for those events compared with co-branded events. When WWE, with WWE making profit hand over fist and the product being more creatively fulfilling than ever, do you see a possibility where they revive this format? Thank you for reading and engaging your fellow wrestling fans. Okay. So I like this. It's a fully formed idea, and you understand uh, all sides of it, and I think that that's a good thing. I don't think that in the era, I don't think that that's a realistic thing. Um, If you look at the way it seems like things are being done right now, it's massive shows four times a year, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Survivor Series, and then most of the other shows that are these five match, two and a half hour or so shows are happening internationally. What you don't want to do is do an international show with half the roster. And I know you're going to tell me, well, it's half the roster if it's only five matches. But you want your five biggest matches from your two shows. You want, I think, these five match shows to be the five biggest matches that your product has to offer right now. And I think that making them brand specific is limiting for no reason. You know, you're not, 
if anything, you're losing one show because on one show, you're now not promoting the fact that that you're doing a, a premium live event. I mean, you could do commercials for it, but one show, the stories that are being told are not leading towards the next premium live event. I mean, if eventually they brought back singularly branded shows, I wouldn't be against it, but they were doing even more pay-per-views then as well. Um, do they have enough stories that they're being told to do that? I think so, especially if they're committed to doing like, you know, four or five match shows. But honestly, I don't see the benefit in it. I don't see why they would. You know, I think that these instead feel like super cards and that the crowd comes alive because it's just big stars on the shows. So I, I think instead what I was talking about with Jey Uso is the better strategy where it's like more and more you find people promoting for their stories and stories will overlap. Like LA Knight has been pushing towards this Logan Paul thing since before the since before Backlash. Right, so LA Knight's not wrestling on Backlash or whatever. I don't remember if he was or not, but point is that if he's not wrestling on this pay-per-view, he's telling the story of whatever his match will be at the next one. Jey Uso is not wrestling at Clash of the Castle, so he's already talking about Money in the Bank. I like that structure better right now, for right now for what's going on than the single-branded PLEs. But I mean, but it's not a dumb idea. Uh, Dustin writes in, greetings from Germany. Love it. This global audience is incredible. It would be interesting to know what you think about the fan reactions to the Dom and Liv story. She's kissing and touching him without consent. Dom looks very uncomfortable. Well, I think I think that that we don't know what Dom's real response to this is yet. We don't know if he's pretending to be uncomfortable. We don't know what tricks are up his sleeve. Keep in mind, Dominic is a villain. Um, P.S. Will you be at Bash in Berlin? Uh... As of now, no, but if you can find a, a a venue that wants to have me and will have me there and everything, I would love to be at Bash in Berlin and host this thing. Uh, meaning a, a live Not Sam Wrestling show like I'm doing in Cleveland. Uh, hi, Sam. A, a deal, I think is how you pronounce your name. Uh, I have heard everyone's fantasy booking of when Roman returns. You have the OG bloodline versus the new bloodline. Uh, at Survivor Series, but I think it'll be more interesting one will be if Cody becomes the fourth member of the OG Bloodline side instead of Sammy, especially if The Rock is going to be with the new Bloodline. Your thoughts? Well, I don't think The Rock is going to be with the new Bloodline in this scenario, and I don't think it'll be more interesting if Cody gets that spot instead of Sammy. I think it would be like, you know, I get it that, oh, can Cody and Roman coexist? But it's like, why people would want to see Sammy there. So no, but I also don't think the rock is going to be in that match. If the rock were in that match and see, you have solo. Oh, rock slash Jacob fat too. Yeah. I mean, I no, I don't, I think if you do a bloodline war games match, I don't think the rock is in it. I don't think it's possible. I just, I don't know. For some reason, I'm not catching that vibe. Um, let's go to Ben who writes in when Bronson Reed was making his entrance at the King and Queen of the Ring event a QR code flashed uh, what I'm here to tell you wasn't what the QR code led to but instead the link somewhere in the wor word uh, Rainerus as it turns out Rainerus is a saint blah 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 point is Rainerus feast stage June 17th which seems to be all signs are pointing towards watch the product speculate wildly yeah yeah that's what I've been talking about um Avik writes in, what's the haps from London? I think this is going to be our last email. Seeing as uh, both you and I have been watching wrestling for over 30 years, was there ever a time where you lost interest in Raw or SmackDown particularly, but still watched the product out of loyalty? For me, it was 2019 post-Kofi Mania. Storylines or rules such as Wild Card Rule, uh, Fiend, Seth, Hell in a Cell, Eric Rowan, Doppelganger, and his Spider. Uh, it made it hard for me to sit during the five hours, uh, blah, blah, blah. Also, I remember on a previous one of my emails, you mentioned giving Sammy money in the bank after beating Gunther, a bit like, how much can we give this guy? I feel like once Chad beats him for the Intercontinental title, Sam for money in the bank Montreal would work. Yeah, I don't think Chad Gable's going to beat him for the Intercontinental title. 
unless Chad beats Sammy, which is possible, Chad beats Sammy with Otis's help, and then, then the split happens, and then Otis beats Chad for the Intercontinental title. You could do that. If you're not going to split up Chad and Otis at Clash at the Castle, you could put the title on Chad, and then Otis eventually wins it from Chad, hypothetically. But still, I just, you know, I don't know. You know, Sammy losing only to, it feels exactly like what happened at WrestleMania this year. So I, it would be in Montreal. No, it wouldn't be in Montreal. Sammy for Money in the Bank in Montreal would work. Money in the Bank's in Toronto, not in Montreal. So yeah, no. So no, still, still it's a no-go for me, Avik. And uh, to answer your first question, um, disinterested i found it tough when they did the uh raw super show when they completely like disposed of the draft and they just made the three hour raw a super show where superstars from raw and smackdown would be there and then nothing was happening on smackdown like for a while it was like before they redid the draft right before they redid the draft i think was when it was like so why am I watching SmackDown again? When SmackDown became a show that you didn't have to watch, it was sad. I still watch, but it was sad. I appreciate all you guys hanging out. We'll talk again soon. Don't forget to get your tickets. Go to NotSam.com for the link to see Not Sam Wrestling Live August 1st in, and Hilarities in Cleveland. Subscribe, leave reviews, leave ratings, do the whole deal. See you soon. Have a good one, everybody.